In Christ there is neither. Paul gives three examples. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. But that list is by no means exhaustive. In Christ there is neither. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now I know that as far back as time records, and probably well before then, we have drawn distinctions among ourselves. We have drawn the line that separates the us from the them. Before history, it was likely Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. There's the line. We are here, they are there, and that is how it should remain. Was it Mark Twain who said, East is East, and West is West, and there the Twain shall meet? I know that is, in essence, part of our human nature to establish who is with us and who is not. And I understand why it may be part of human nature. Because I understand fear as a survival tactic. I understand the desire to draw that line between the us and the them because it protects the us. It keeps the us safe from harm. When Israel was in Egypt, enslaved by the Pharaoh. There was very clearly the us and the them. Very clearly the us and the them for both the children of Israel, the children of Abraham, and for the Egyptians. And when the children of Israel were led across the Red Sea and into the Promised Land, the distinctions remained. There was the us, the children of Abraham, the children of Israel, and there was the them, the, all the nations that surrounded the land that was promised to Abraham. And the line was clearly drawn, sometimes into great violence, when whole towns were wiped out as Israel came in to the new land. This was protection for Israel. They had to draw the line between the us and the them, or the us would cease to exist. The distinctions held throughout Israel's history, even under the time of Jesus. There was the us of the Jews and the them of the Gentiles. There was the other them of the Samaritans, who were originally Israelite, but were a tribe that split off. There was the us and the them, but here's where it gets interesting, my friends. Our master, the Lord of heaven and earth, the leader of Israel, the leader of Christians, started breaking down walls. Now, throughout history, there have also been others who have broken down laws, but as his followers, I want to focus on him right now. He came along and he sat in his journeys for a supper one night. He sat with two sisters named Mary and Martha. Do you remember the story? Martha was working away, slaving away to make sure that their guest had everything that he needed to feel comfortable, while Mary sat there with him. And Martha, remember, says, Jesus, tell her to get up and do some work too. And Jesus says, no, I won't. Well, in itself, that was strange. But the real radical nature of this story was that Jesus, a male, was sitting alone with two women. The first hearers of that story, my friends, would have been outright scandalized. If a woman is going to be in the presence of another man, she must also be in the presence of her father, her husband, her brother, or her son. Because men and women were not to be alone together. 
And so imagine, we focus on Mary and Martha, the one working and the one not, but the real scandal underneath the story is the fact that Jesus is even there. Why is he there? Because he's breaking down the walls between male and female. He would also do it when he met the Samaritan woman at the well. And he actually talked with her, to her directly. Not through a father, a husband, a son, or a brother. He talked with her alone. He talked with a woman. He talked with a Samaritan. The walls were crumbling down. Just like Joshua standing outside the gates of Jericho. The walls were falling. One time, Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Master, there are people out there who are casting out evil spirits in your name. Tell them to stop. They said, Master, there's somebody who's not one of us. It's the them doing something. Tell them to stop. Jesus says, no. Whoever is not against us is for us. The walls come crumbling down. And as the church grew in its first age, which is called the apostolic age, as it grew, this emphasis on breaking down walls was very strong. In fact, Paul will say in three of his letters, in Christ there is neither. Three of his letters to three different communities. When you see it once, you should take notice. When you see it three times in three different communities, there's something here. This is obviously important. Now, I wish that I could say that Paul was writing simply to encourage communities that had it right. But he doesn't. We know when he's speaking to the church at Corinth that they were drawing lines left, right, and center. They were drawing lines between free and slave. They were drawing lines between wealthy and poor. They were drawing lines between men and women. They were drawing lines between those who spoke in tongues and those who didn't. Paul will actually say, shall I commend you for this? The walls are there. And Paul is saying, tear them down. In Christ, those walls cannot exist. It was a focus within the apostolic church that slave and free, rich and poor, men and women should be together as one community. Over time, the apostolic church passed away and the institutional church arose. And then something horrible happened to the community of Christ. I don't want to sound cruel to history and I don't want to sound arrogant as if to say we've got it all right now. I'll say more about that after. But in that time, the rise of the institutional church, what happened was society's boundaries, society's walls, society's divisions became the church's separations and divisions and walls. The church became the protector of societal values. The church became the protector of the walls that divide people. Now, I would like to say, I wish I could say, that those, that that scenario only held true for a short time, or a century, or even a millennium. But I cannot. Because my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, those walls exist today. And they exist within Christ's body. There are still the divisions between the us and the them. There are still the lines that let us know who's in and who's not. There are still gender divisions. I've had to deal with this in my ministry, and I've only been in the body of Christ for a quarter of a century. Churches looking for a minister. Oh, well, if they hire a woman, I'm not going back. I don't want to listen to a woman preacher. I've heard it, my friends. I've heard it in the so-called progressive, liberal, mainline church. 
I came into the church in the wake of the 1988 decision, where the church made the boldest step at that point that any Christian denomination in the world had made, that they would accept as valid the ordination of those who were gay or lesbian. I came into the church partly because of that decision. But I saw once I came in the huge divide that still existed. The walls that divide, we were singing at that point out of songs for a gospel people. Walls that divide are broken down. Christ is our unity. And then we drew those lines ever more firmly. I remember the now, the, uh, the, actually it was them too, the partner of our current moderator was ordained, or would have been ordained, except he couldn't get a church. This was after 1988. And it would take a number of years for him to finally get a church where he could stand in the pulpit and preach. Now we have come a great distance since 1988, but the walls that divide are still there. The walls that divide between rich and poor within the mainline church are still strong. You know right off the hop what type of church you've entered into as soon as you go inside. Are signs of prosperity emphasized and lifted up? If you come in in a pair of jeans, do you feel welcome? I find it sad in this time that we still need to emphasize to people, come as you are. That shouldn't have to be said by any church. Now, if you want to wear a suit and a tie, great, hallelujah. If you don't like ties, then should it make a difference? If you're in jeans, should it matter? In Christ, we are all one. The walls that divide need to be broken down. And that's our job, my friends. You and me here in this place. It's our job to tear down the walls. It's our job to explore the diversity that exists among us. See, here's a crucial point. As we sit together, we all look fairly similar. We all probably have fairly common stock. We're not a hugely diverse group. But every one of us gathered here today is different. Now we can accept the surface as we gather together over coffee and just you know, chat with one another. How's your day going? How'd the weekend go? How was Valentine's? We can chat together and we'll never see the difference and we'll feel nice and safe in a homogenous group. But then we have only been a friendly church. Now, have you ever noticed that every church is a friendly church? The question is, who are we friendly to? When we, as the body of Christ, begin to dig deeper, to get to know each other more fuller, we find out the differences between us. We find out that we are not all the same, that we are not, no matter how much it might look like, that we are not a homogenous group. And there, my friends, I, I know it, it doesn't feel as safe when you do that. I know there's a comfort in knowing that you're with like people. But there is an incredible joy found in digging deeper and getting to know each other more. If you walk into a garden, a beautiful garden, is it all one flower? 
I love people who do the wild gardens. Now, I don't garden at all. I think weeds are a beautiful enough flower, and I'm willing to leave them there. And if God put them there, God will look after them. Amen. <laughs> My neighbors don't like the dandelion season. <laughs> but you look at the wildflower gardens, and they're so incredibly diverse. When they're not, when they're left to grow, and how it's not just here's the section of this flower, here's the section of this flower, here's the section of this flower. How they meld together in this beautiful, beautiful tapestry. That's what Christ hopes for his church. That we would be this beautiful tapestry of different people coming together and exploring our differences together. Exploring who we are together to build community. The church was never called to be friendly. Let's call a spade a spade. And from a marketing perspective, it really doesn't matter because every church does say they are friendly. What matters is the getting deeper community. Discover our differences and then learn and grow. Discover who each other is. Now, I want to take a moment and lift up this congregation because we have been blessed. And because we have been blessed, we have been a blessing to others. A few years ago, four years ago specifically, the question came to us, should we open up our doors for a homeless shelter? Lines were quickly drawn. Even in a church that wants to be a caring community, and there were those who said, yes, we must do this. There were those who said, I'm not sure one way or the other. And there were those who said, no, we should not. Let somebody else take care of it. The lines were there. We ended up moving through. We ended up housing the in out of the cold. And we ended up receiving an incredible blessing. Because here, we got to meet people. We get to meet people with a different life experience from us. We got to know people within our midst who before we likely would not have known. And in fact, I would argue, and I'll argue this from my experience, we wouldn't have even seen. I knew that there was homelessness in Toronto. I knew that there was homelessness in Winnipeg. I knew that there was homelessness in Vancouver. But I never dreamed that in the small city of St. Thomas, there would be those who would live in the streets. That there would be those who would make it out to the edge of town whenever they could to sleep in a barn that was left open at night. I never noticed people who were in that situation. And I say that to my shame. I didn't see them. They were there. They were there. I didn't see them. And I don't think I'm different from a lot of us gathered here today. And yet, through receiving the blessing and opening up to the end was a blessing to us. It was a God-given gift to Central United Church. And through it, we felt we could be a blessing to others as well. And now, we have people who come, leave on the front door on Sunday morning, and then come around into the back. And they come for different reasons. They come because they want to hear the Word of God. They come because from 8 a.m. until at least 12.30, maybe even later, there's coffee on it. And it's a warm place. And we have been a blessing because of that. And we have been blessed because of that. We have been a blessing and been blessed because we were willing to look beyond the wall. We were willing to do our part to tear down the particular to allow one line to be blurred, to move deeper, my friends, into community. And so, yes, I proudly commend you folks for that. We still have ways to go. 
There are still, even in our midst, lines that divide. There are walls that separate us. Many of the walls we aren't even aware of. The Spirit of Christ calls us to look at the world around us with open eyes and open hearts. To experience the depth of diversity among God's children. Not to look at it with fear, but to look at it as a means for us to grow and to see the incredible beauty that lies in God's creation. The fact that we are not all alike is not something to be afraid of. It is something to be celebrated. It is a means for us, a reason for us to give praise to God. Because we all are different. We all have different experiences in life. We all have different fears and hopes and dreams. And a community will share those together and we will learn from one another. We will step into moments where we feel uncomfortable and we will grow through them. We have been blessed before and through that we have been a blessing to others. The call upon us is to keep it going. Don't let it stop. But open our eyes and our hearts to see the possibilities that lie around us. To see the people, not just categories, but to see people and celebrate who we have been made by. Amen.